Yeah. Uh huh. Welcome to the Shooters Row, made by the fans for the fans. Yeah. Uh huh. With your host D Swizzle and T. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Shooters Row. You know me. I'm T. I'm your boy. Here every week with all the amazing stories, and I like to introduce uh, my panel. So the first off, we got the man. They call him the Magic Man, or sometimes some people call him D Swizzle. Uh, what's up, man? How Stop are you? Tea. It's good to be on. Yeah, how, how are you doing today? Not too bad. Um, surviving, trying yep. to keep a positive outlook. Uh, everyone's coming slowly back into uh, what used to be the normal, but I suppose nothing is normal these days. So um, just just trying to keep my my head, you know, in the game. Yeah. Cool. Good and 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 I can see you have King's gear. Is this like a um a clue on who's our next guest? Oh or... uh, it's a hint. It's a hint, but I'm just representing my hometown. So uh gotta show some love. <laughs> all about the love. I'm all about the love. All about the love. Thank you for being with us, D Swizzle. So yeah, so I'm gonna introduce my next guest. Um we've put it on social media with this hype video that we created, but he hasn't seen. Uh we got um NBL legend in the house. We got Ben Knight. What's up, Ben? What's up, guys? Thanks for having me on uh, on your show. Yeah, we are. Um, yeah, glad to have you on. Talk about some hoops. How, how are you doing today? Yeah, good. Just finished a, a session earlier. We're sort of slowly getting back into it with uh, one of my jobs, one of the school teams. So it's uh, okay. slowly, slowly getting it going a little bit after quite a large hiatus. Mm. Yeah, we'll. We'll get into um, what, what you've been doing lately. So let's start out. So let's start out with, I guess, your, your career. So um, doing, doing research for, I guess, your career. I, I can see that um, you started your career with the Kings uh, for four games. Uh, you, you moved around the league, um, the Kings three times, and then you won the championship two times, uh, and you had a long, long-standing career. I'm basically going to flash up your history on the screen. So people can read that, but I wanted to get into some something interesting. So Ben, what's the best team that um, you ever played for in the NBL? Well, I'd have to say the Sydney Kings. You know, coming home after starting my career here, um, to come back and and win the third championship. I only unfortunately got one championship. I lost the second one going in for the Sydney Kings fourth championship, when um, the Kings fans and people might know Roland Roberts. Uh, tried to do the Vince Carter dunk for the All Star game and ripped his yep. peck off. Yeah, uh, I yeah, remember that. Made it, made it, made us quite small and tough. I, uh, from then on, but um, I think that year being the way it was set up to sweep with a you know a record margin in the grand final against the Hawks and to do it at home at the Sydney Entertainment Centre uh, in front of friends, family was being away for so long was probably a special year and good, and good to do that um, in Sydney. Yep. Um... What was the best team uh, you ever, I guess, played against in the NBL? Like your hardest opponent or, or whatever reason was a lot. That, that you found it the hardest? When you played as long as I have, there's a lot, you know, but I think the first, the second year in the league after I left the Sydney Kings to go to the South East Melbourne Magic and we were, you know, really loaded team. Um, back then, the best of three series went away home home. So we went to Adelaide and dropped game one and then uh, they brought, a fair few busloads of people to uh, mm. uh, Melbourne Park and, and wrapped it all up in two games and it sort of hit us like a ton of bricks. But I felt that team uh, Adelaide had with Kevin Brooks out of the NBA, Darnell Mee, also an ex NBA player, was yeah. just primed at the right time. Catalini's, um, you know, great role players and very well coached. They were, they were a really, really good team. And I wouldn't say surprised us, but just was just sharp from the start and got it done. They played a loose style of basketball and um, it was enough to, to I guess, sweep us and, and get themselves another cha- a championship. Yeah. So, so speaking of on, on your achievements, I can see, yeah, so you won the championship. Is it, is it twice or was, or was it once that you said? I won it in New Zealand and then yep. Wellington, but only once in the NBA. I was in three grand so, final campaigns, lost one with the Magic right, yeah. I just spoke about, won the yep. third championship with the Sydney Kings, and then we lost the fourth to the Melbourne Tigers when Chris mm-hmm. Anstey came back and the Roland Roberts, um, you know, just the losing dunk, that, yeah. big, that big hurt. Like I, I ended up playing a bit of centre at the end and was able to go there, but having my natural position was really the power forward spot. Um, you know, just to not have that extra big 
and we went, we went with Cedric. Uh, um, trying to think of the paper. It was more of a shooting guard we brought in. It just, just, just didn't have enough, I guess. And that Melbourne team was built in a way to really challenge the Kings after the dominance that Sydney had yeah. uh, for those several years. Yeah, so, so looking at your achievements, you, you started in 2000 as six men of the year. Uh, you were on the national team for the 01, 04. Yep. Um, during that time, what was, the, I guess, the, the best team you ever played against you know, like in, during national duty? Uh, I mean, always USA. We're lucky to play them at Melbourne Park. Uh, you know, that was, we played them twice there. That was, they were outstanding um, team, but it was that second wave. We were a second wave, I think, of what happened post 2000 Olympics, where I think nine guys retired, a lot of veterans, mm -hmm. the gays as Brad Keys and that. And it was the chance for the, the, the younger generation to maybe come through and get a chance. It was the same with the NBA, but they were all, all NBA guys, all super talented. Baron Davises, you know, yeah. Jermaine O'Neal's. It was pretty, pretty loaded. And um, that was, that was a, a really strong, strong team. The Spanish team was starting to be put together quite well also. But um, I guess the mistake we made was going to New Zealand and losing that series. We did not get to go to the 2002 World Champs where it was wide open really, because New Zealand were very screwed, prepared very well, and they beat Australia when only one team could go from Oceania, and they ended up fourth in that world champ. So we put the team, the talent we had, it could have been a, a top four medal performance potentially, but we didn't get that opportunity to, uh, to, to play, and um, that's how it went. And the next stint was 2004 Olympics, and I was one of the last guys cut to, uh, to go to Athens. So that's sort of how it rolls sometimes. Yeah. Mm. It's a bit heartbreaking yeah. when uh, you you work you work your ass off and uh, just at that final hurdle. Uh, yeah, but you yeah. know your career. I was looking through your stats and um, what was quite interesting. You had some great statistical seasons with Cairns, um, and also noting you made the All NBL third team. I think in uh, 01. Um, the those early days um, when you were playing the the makeup of the league um how did you find yourself trying to you know use your strengths because you, you were your field goal percentages are quite they're very very good the most of the most of the seasons you're above 50 percent um shooting in the field. um what was the keys for you, you know to to drive your success through your throughout your playing career I think there'd been a lot of great players before me and I just looked at a lot of guys that what they'd done for longevity and most added stuff to their games, you know, yeah. and I really learned the post game at a young age, you know, went down, left the Kings to go to the Southeast Melbourne Magic to work with Brian Gorge and they had my army from, from the work and the numbers I was putting up in the Seabull, playing for the Sydney Kings youth team in 95 and then the Penrith Panthers in 96 and then Sydney Kings youth again, which was my first year with Matt Nielsen and myself playing for the Sydney Kings as rookies in 97, even though we trained a little bit in 95, but that was a real, I guess, a learning curve you could see. So, it was just like, okay, well, I'm going to work on the post game. We're going to get a, a right hand hook, yeah. master that, then get a left hand hook, add a counter, then maybe play a bit of face up game. Then it's suddenly not just a pick and roll guy, you can pick and pop, you know, you can stretch the floor. So I guess you get that evolution each year, just sort of added to your game. And, and, and that, that was the real key. I, I think the three ball wasn't as important back then as it is now. And I think that would have been good now to step out because now I probably shoot the three as it later years better than ever because I practiced it more and it just became more relevant and I teach a lot more. So I've still got to have that game behind the arc, but it's just a matter of reps. And as you get older, as you see through trends in professionals, the NBA guys, you become a spot up shooter more. It's just what it sort of happens. And uh, I guess that was the challenge and the exciting part to keep adding things to your game. You know, I went deliberately, I took opportunities in many different countries in different areas so mm. I could see how the game was played. Cause I thought overall that would help my development as an individual and as a player and some were just short stints, you know, in Malaysia, um, you know, short league in New Zealand, but it's just always that wanting to put the work in and wanting to work on your game and in love the work. And that was it. If once that time come, find another job, do something else. And I think I enjoyed the off seasons and putting the work in. And I think that's what kept me playing so long and kept me healthy so long. I mean, you mentioned it yourself, uh, NBL journeyman, basketball journeyman at that because of um, your your stints abroad as well um the 
the, the way you, you carried yourself, was, is there a secret in terms of, you know, you played for nine NBL teams, um, yeah. pretty much did the rounds, uh, saw every organisation. Um, what, what stood out during, during any of those stints for you? What, what was most memorable? I guess the, the change a little bit in the Kings over the, mm. the three different times, different ownership, different yeah. groups. Mike Robleski did an amazing job, great guy. But I just felt that they struggled to even make the top six. They were great off the floor, sellouts and that, but they just didn't quite have a winning culture. And that was hard when you're a rookie. You don't understand what it takes to be successful and then survive in the league. And I think going to Melbourne where it was so competitive with you know Brett Brown coaching North Melbourne, the Gays, you know, legendary Gays family running the Tigers program and then us, the Magic, sharing that facility. Um, you know, th th things like that all the way along, I just I think of really the decisions I made, I guess, really helped form who I was overall. And a lot of the teams just dropped out. I was, I was in and got involved in basketball very late. You know, I was a top age under 18s player. I made the state New South Wales training squad before I played reps because the trials were so earlier. And you mentioned Auburn Basketball Centre before. That's where the trials were. And I remember a hot summer's day and just suddenly making those cuts. So I just guess I was a late developer, grew late. And, you know, I just felt like I always had, to, had a chip on my shoulder from how I grew up, where I was, always about proving yourself from the street. You know, it's just a little bit more like that. And it just worked well with the toughness you need uh, to play basketball and to survive in any professional sport or professional as a career. Uh, growing up, uh, how, you, you mentioned it, uh, you were late playing at a game of basketball. What drew you in? What, what were you playing when you were younger? Soccer. soccer. Soccer from five, but just stayed five to 15. So 10 years of soccer. Was in goals. You know, I'm 6'8", but have a 7'1 wingspan. Should have probably stayed in goals, you know. I'm sure a lot of goal soccer, <laughs> soccer Australian that would have loved that. But um, it just was a little boring after a while. So once I sort of got in the midfield, I went backs and midfields, I felt like I'm suited to, you know, being able to develop opportunities, defend and be a little bit in between. And basketball gives you that opportunity when you go from 11, 13, 18 people in AFL to five. I'm thinking, okay, well, there's five guys. I've got a hell of a lot more control than what goes on. If I can, you know, just work on my game, you know, um, earn, earn the right to be in this team, get respected, then that's how I took every approach all the way along. And I guess then I did get a lot of opportunities along, along the way, but I worked, I worked for those opportunities and I always had jobs year in, year out and, and multiple offers to, 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 to go places. So I think that was a real positive the way I conducted my, myself as a player. I was very professional. Um, you know, I really learned to take care of my body and eat well with in a Gorgian type system. You know, and that was that was huge. It was unfortunate that I didn't get to see the last two years of my contract because they merged with the North Melbourne Giants. And, you know, you're funny now, Brett Brown and Gorge and both of them are outstanding coaches and Gorge gets the nod and Brett ends up going to be an intern at the Spurs, which ends out for him and works out. And it was just yeah. amazing. You look now at those decisions, how it was. And I think it was a dumb, yeah. dumb decision back in the day when Melbourne is the epicenter of basketball and, you know, you merge these two huge different types of um, communities and rivals and they made the Victorian Titans. And I thought at the time it hurt, hurt basketball. That same change went to a summer league really quick. We didn't have the gap year that soccer had, the two year sort of A league to get it right. They obviously had to bring a lot of different communities and people and backgrounds together. We just went winter, you know, gap season, summer. So it was very difficult for sponsorship and fans to have to, I guess, uh, br bring the financial obligations. And, um, you know, so who, who knows if it was right or wrong, but summer is where it went for pretty much the next 14, 15 seasons for me. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's, it's, it has worked out. You've, you've traveled the country and, you know, played at all venues and, all major uh, NBL teams was was the travelling and relocating tough for you and and your and, and your family. Well, you, you get, I've been a bachelor a lot of my time, so you know, no children, so it has been quite easy for me to take jobs over others. You know, um, 
I lost my father when I was young, so I had my mother to rule really over. But she stayed in Sydney for a while. Then when I ended up in Cairns, and the first long-term deal I had, uh, she came up there when I built a house up in Cairns, and, and we made that work. And then after three years, I moved on, and I guess in a way I came back to the Hawks and then the Kings. If that didn't happen, I might not have had the championship or the chance to win the championship with the Kings potentially. But you know, you just got to get your head around it. You, that you you can't just live in the place you want to live and play in the team you want to play. Yeah. You've got to be able to take jobs anywhere in the world. And I was lucky that I was playing in China in 97 and was one of the first tours to go and things like that. So I saw how global the game was and, you know, obviously how big it is in Europe, things like that. It's, it's, you just realize that you could be in any of these countries and it's a big deal in all of these countries. We were still like, I'm not sure where basketball was at quite then it was coming, but it was still, you know, AFL, league, union dominant, three main core sort of sports. Soccer was coming, but it wasn't really relevant as it was globally in the World Cup. So, I mean, I suddenly started to see that soccer and basketball were the two biggest things globally everywhere I went. And it was like, okay, this is this is different. So getting out of Australia and seeing that was a real eye-opener. And uh, then obviously you throw in a splash of going to the States a lot and you go, wow, look at sports in America. This is, you know, I want to play in the NBA, of course. Yeah. So Michael Jordan was the guy that changed my life, really. I saw him play and I say, Scotty Pippen, I wore 33 because of Bird and Pippen. And I saw Magic, I saw Bird, I saw that late 80s. Then I see Jordan, I go, what is that dude doing? Like you watch a soccer player, you watch that and you go, and that's, everyone respects it. And I think the last dance that everyone watched that I know, everyone in the world <laughs> watched that timing that sees it. And that whole winning toughness, calling people out. Uh, people don't go there nowadays. It's 2020. Everyone's a little soft around the edges. Everyone's got feelings, all this. And, you know, it's hard to be that guy to want to be the winner because I think that's a, a great example of a lot of times how it, how it comes out. And people, particularly nowadays, I don't think respond too well to that. You know, he's, he's the arsehole. He's the bad guy, you know. And I think that was his biggest fear about bringing that documentary out after sitting on it for that long. Yeah, but I think we could all see the difference and how that led to Kobe. Okay, do you see that being LeBron? You just see it. You just can see that way. And um, he just realized, I just remember having a height chart, uh, you know, six six Bulls, Jordan, height chart in my room. I just said, I'm going to be taller than you one day. And I just got that six, seven inch growth spurt from 15 to 17 and the rest is history, you know? Yeah, that's it. Mm. That's it. Yeah, it's good um, how you mentioned the last dance. We covered it in, in, in our earlier podcast. We covered uh, every every episode. So it was a yeah. great um, it was a great show, and um, especially the time where we needed it during these um, crazy times. Of course, cool. yeah, we're all we're all NBA guys. I'm sure, like most athletes and <laughs> part of <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But I thought it was really well presented, really well done, and there was great timing on it. True. Uh, let's, move on, let's move on to, I guess, what you're up to, Ben. Rather than me telling everyone what you're doing, um, can you talk about what you're doing now? And um, I, I know that you still play for North and you're still the head coach. Um, yep. What else are you up to? Yeah, I guess I wasn't sure at a retirement, you know, in 2011. I sat on it for six months and just took a job at a, at a private school and then uh, just started, just fell into it, just coaching the seconds at Redlands and then uh, got involved in Maccabi basketball. I'm still involved there. So that was my club team. And then Norse approached me and that was a relationship I've had now for nine, nine seasons. So I'm in my ninth one now. We're about to restart in July 18 is, is the plan so far here in, in, in New South Wales. Uh, but the only state league that will be operating, you know, for all accounts. So um, I just guess... I've, I've stayed with Maccabi for, for that long. I did a lot with the juniors, but now I just work really with the seniors and I play as the, a non-Jewish import on Monday nights in the Premier League. So it's fun <laughs> to get my still fix. I think it's a game that I'll play, you know, is, until I can't walk, I'll play. So I make sure that I can always be walking. I play a lot more golf nowadays and things like that. But I guess I wanted to see what the landscape was like in Sydney, New South Wales, after being away for so, so long. And, and finishing up here as captain of the Kings, I was in four countries in six years. So I really wanted to see club association and that, that sort of level school basketball. And I guess I've just continued, um, you know, providing those services along the way. I'm at a public school now at Balgala Boys in my fourth year where I've built that up from two teams in year seven to 200 players playing now. And, um, you know, I was a public school boy, so I like, I like to give give back like that. But it's um, it's been a, a really um, positive thing, you know, just over on the, on the northern beaches of, 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 uh, of Sydney here. And um, Norse, as I said, I'm in my ninth season, so 
um, you know, it's been been fun working with a lot of guys that I feel that I'm my, my real role there is to develop players and a lot of the younger guys coming through because it's such a huge jump from under 18s yep. to go to maybe a youth league or straight to college. And a lot of these guys, maybe in certain situations, are you know thinking, oh, I'm just Division One college and that's it. But it's like you don't realize how competitive it is to get mm-hmm. those scholarships. And I think that's where I guess Norse using that as a vehicle has been really positive for that, that gap because you know how we line up with that. 10 month window where they finish year 12 here and they can't get in. So a lot really lock in and basically can be like professionals, you know, they get their two or three lifts in a week, they're training, they're getting individual work done and it's a really good way to assist players. And I feel like we send them over a lot closer to being like men than boys. And I think that's a, that's been fun to work with. We did miss out on being in the NBL one this year, but hopefully uh, next year, all accounts, I think a lot more uh, of the, uh, I guess state bodies are looking to make that. I think we were the only one in WA that wasn't a part of that movement. So um, that's that's really, I do a lot of individual skill work. I train beginners to, to pros. So keep them busy all, all the time. Um, it's been been quite challenging with this, the, the hiatus of three or four months. So um, just trying to put things more online, training workouts and videos. And I had one on YouTube where, I just was Mike and Drew with two Mike and Drew. Yep. Yeah. That's I'm, like, I'm like, I'm looking at it and I'm like, Oh, the other's got a few hundred. This one's got 50,000 now. I'm like, maybe I should write Mike in in every drill. Cause it seemed like <laughs> it was the key word. Kyrie Irvin had one after it. Next year I had one after it. And it was always, I guess known as a big guy drill, but it's just a finishing yep. drill. Really? That's it's really a finishing drill. Yeah. So you're training both hands evenly. Yep. Yeah. That's it. You just work on so, all that. And you know, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so Ben, you talk about um, developing players, right? So uh, do you also um, help them, like, how to live there? Because I've, I've seen some college kids go over and, and, and they can't handle the lifestyle of, like, buying their own food, cooking for themselves. Yep. Uh, talk about that and, and how you, you, you help them, like the, the North Sydney Bears. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a tough one because I guess when you first go, it's probably smart to live on campus. I guess just to feel the surrounds of college life, you know, you're going to be close to a lot more people uh, that know what's going on. You know, I don't think cafeteria food is great in America, but it's free. So that, that is what it is. And I think after that first year or so, you take that extra stipe money. And uh, there's a couple of players I've talked to now that are juniors and that I've got over there are, uh, uh, you know, they get their own place and own house off campus. And I think that's when they really grow up a bit more. They sort of a, probably are 21, 22, the legal at old age, I guess, in America. And they have to start to learn to, to just take care of themselves a little bit better. I think that comes with maturity. I think it's one of the best things I did. I moved out of home at 19. I had to learn to suddenly cook for myself and just do a lot of things like that. Because the biggest thing for an athlete is you have to really be aware of what you're putting in your body. Every single thing. I became an expert label reader, you know, because you just don't know. I went through a stage where Codrill was illegal and you could get a two year ban because it had pseudo effort during that. Now yeah. that's okay. So it's like, you just got to be very, very careful in the States. There's a lot more products that aren't regulated really. And a lot of players bring that back with them and you could just suddenly be, you know, banned. We, you know, was drug tested quite consistently a lot and just going to be careful of a lot of things like that. But when you're talking about your body is a temple and you're trying to be a professional and your windows short, there's just no excuse to lock into your diet and living, being as healthy and the best you can be. And I think that's the, the big message, especially in America is tough because everything's so cheap to eat junk really. So that's the, the hard, the hard part about it. So I think, you know, that's the real thing with basketball. I found with a lot of players, you help them become, you know, boys and girls, you help them become, you know, better people, but more women and men. And that's where they're growing into. And I think there's a lot of life lessons in playing team sports and a sport like basketball that it can really, really teach you. Yep. Yeah, talk about uh, uh, one player. We have a, I think, a, a player we both coached before, uh, Alana God, uh, Goodchild. So I coached yes. uh, in under 13s. Um, Talk, talk to me about, I guess, how, how yep. you worked on a game and um, where she is now in terms of her, her development. Yeah, well, probably just after you coached uh, their uh, T, she um, came to North. So she was at North Street and then she's been at yep. Hornsby since. So we had a bit of a connection from there when she first came. And then uh, one thing about Alana, she's just really high work ethic. You know, she just can't get enough of basketball. And I think she's a real student of the game and, uh, you know, just, from all levels so far, the goals we've set, she's done really well, you know, and, and I think now that she's finally down at the COE after getting an opportunity earlier in the year and then COVID hit to now, you know, get, get into that mix, I think it's going to be really, really positive for her because it's such a 
unbelievable opportunity to be in that environment. And, you know, it's just she's been able to shoot the outside shot, which is really good. She's got post game, you know, we've worked on her speed and lateral quickness. And that's something that she just has to keep continue with and uh, show that, you know, not sure how much taller sometimes you can grow and so those extra assets have been tougher and you know being comfortable with your size but you know just adding things to your game that's one thing I spoke about earlier that she's consistently doing always adding things and parts to a game and I guess that's what you need to to take it to the next level and and really play in that elite level for a long time you've got to be able to keep changing with the times and concepts and and you just got to be be willing to put in that work and she, she I can't falter on, on, on her effort and energy to to try and get better in that way definitely you've taken on a, a coaching mentoring role um when you were a player tell me what was what was the best advice that you were given by a coach i think brian gorgian early on because i had two stints with gorge where yeah. um i think you know, he changed. He's always very adaptable and changing with the times. And I thought that first one we lost to Adelaide, I felt we might have been a little bit um, cooked by the end of the season. And then by the the next, by the work ethic that was on it, then by the, the, the next time around with the Kings, it was really sort of backed off at the right time. We got the timing right. And he just felt like you could just run 100 miles. You could jump six inches higher. It was just the way that it worked hard, but smart, smart, efficient work. I thought that stayed with me. But I think the big message from him was, you know, you go out in the town, you know, enjoy yourself a little bit, but just understand, you know, maybe... You know, get, pick up early maybe and get home early, you know, because the ones that stay and nothing good happens too late at night. And I think I remember him always sort of say, saying that to some of us. And, um, you know, he is, is a character. He's always, always up with the lingo, always up with the, the guys. He just had a way of dealing with every individual in a way that was comfortable. And, he, you know, yeah. he, he knew... He knew what made you tick, I guess. And so he knew he could really go at me and I'd respond. Where other guys, you know, he could go at them and, and we'd lose them. They'd go in the tank and then we'd have to, like, get the leadership team to build them back up. And it's just all a part of the game that goes on within the game, the leadership of getting the best, the best out of guys. And I think he really had a had a real master stroke and still has, obviously, of, of being able to do that. And taking that on board um, in terms of your coaching, uh, what would you tell a, a young and up-and-coming player? Um, what would be the best advice you would give to that person? I guess we yeah, respect the game and be a student of the game. You know, that's really it. The more you put into it, the more you're going to get out. Make sure that you're there early, wanting to work out and prepare for sessions. And, you know, you, you, know, you still have your fun and still what you got to do, but get the work done first. And I think that's, that's one of the best messages I could probably take. And I, I think... You know, it's different maybe when you're younger to older because I know some guys couldn't last in the program that he had. And he always did have a lot of younger guys because of the workload. So you just at different times it works for you, I guess, and how, how it is. And he, um, you know, it's, it's something, I guess, nowadays they just see, in a way, the NBA and all the money and all that. But it's so difficult to, to make it in the NBA. So there's so many good other leagues you can play in. And... Just, just, just be open to want to travel, uh, open to want to see the world, and yeah, you know, embrace it all because it, it can really give you so much, so much back if you if you've got that mindset, you know. Because you, most times you're probably gonna, I'm not going to make the team that you really want to make, you know. It's 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 quite tough. Cool. This is all. Uh, I just want to touch on. Um... The, the the National League, Ben. Um, yeah. Last season, uh, it was cut. The final series was cut short. Title awarded to Perth, given um, what was happening with COVID. Uh, new season slated to start in October. Um, how are you feeling about the new season? Um, I don't think I don't think it'll be October. I don't think it'll be October because it's a television deal. It'll start after the AFL and NRL. And they're, yeah. they're going to be pushed way back. You saw the Essendon thing on the weekend. Yeah. Yep. Now, this is the crazy stuff. You know, what happens if that goes on in the bubble in the NBA? 1,800 people working. Like, you just don't know what the setbacks mm. can be. So, I think it's really, obviously, we're all hurting with a lot of things right now. But to have so much positive momentum 
to now, and the NBL is just starting, I think, to just really make that presence globally as well as yeah. you know, uh, nationally as a, you know, I'm starting to see highlights on every channel. I'm starting to see them talking about it, coming up on, you know, each news channel. That, that, that hasn't been happening, you know, and so ESPN, the coverage there, it's huge. So, you know, I think it's smart that we do start after the AFL and NRL Grand Finals just because of that, that extra exposure. But, you know, it is a short league. So I guess either way, you know, I was surprised we didn't go to a 32 games last year when we added a team, you know, mm-hmm. like it's, I don't know why you're playing 28 games. It should be playing everyone twice at home, twice away. Um, and it makes it even because sometimes you don't play that right team or whatever. And correct, correct. To me, because I think a 12 team league is unreal. So that's a 44 game season by that model. You know, I think the way the, the venues, the entertainment is, it's more like the NBA than ever. Um, just with the presentation, the game nights is consistent a lot of places. And I think just the way, like you guys, we're talking now, having this platform to talk, different things like five and a half million people are watching the game at 2 a.m., you know, when Ball and, you know, is playing against RJ and all this. Like, that's that's legit, man. Like this NBA, NBL, Rising Stars thing, I think a lot more guys are looking at. Well, why would you go to America right now? You know, like, seriously, like, it, it's scary. You don't know what's going to go on. I've got a couple of players who got calls this week about when they're supposed to be getting there for this year. So um, I think the NBL is really in healthy shape. Unfortunately, now, how does that affect us with the reduction in imports? Yeah. How does that ref- you know, affect us in potentially the, the, the reduction in talent because of the new you know, agreement that it's, if you're over 200 grand, you go 50% down? Well, it seems to me you're allowed to renegotiate with your club. You can make up any figures you like if it's 50% slice. I mean, it seems like Perth and the Masters have always keeping guys and naturalising guys and Bryce Cotton isn't far away, which is good for Australia and the boomers to have that, uh, that, that a potential guy like that. But yeah. they've had a real knack of doing that for a long time. But Nick Kay and him both, you know, go to look overseas, whether that's a media thing or whatever, and then re-sign and whatever they get with them. Well, you've got to be smart. You've got a good agents, good representation, and then work it out. But, um, you know, I think the Kings, you know, it's going to be tough for them. I guess, you know, it's, it's Bogut. You're not sure where he's at, um, you know, right now. We hope he plays. We're loving to be at the Olympics. But yeah, I think he's just moved up to South East Queensland. Um, so it's going to be really challenging. I think it's going to be really interesting. So I think you're Australian and you're local talent more than ever. And a lot of the boys uh, out there right now are going, well, should I go back to college? You know, like, would I really want to go back to America where I don't even know if the season's going to happen with no spectators? I could be potentially here, starting to earn a living, starting to get into my professional, um, my career earlier. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's very interesting times how, how it, it unfolds. And as we talked about earlier, is is Tasmania definitely in next year? Is that guaranteed? Like, it was yeah. all, all accounts. Does that delay this whole COVID situation? Does it delay them coming in? You know, because a lot of big part of the deal was to create jobs and be a part of that whole development in, in Tasmania where the state government's been unbelievable to get behind it. Uh, it's quite a big basketball state, you know. Uh, and so I think, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are, you guys on it, but it's it's definitely, you know, it's, it's sad after building so much momentum. Can we just get through this little period and then it kicks again? Because we know we've got an outstanding league. We play fast. We score points. Yep. You know, and it's an entertaining. Like how many games are over a hundred this year? In forty minutes. So that's it's it's good basketball to watch. You know, everyone wants to see scoring. Every sport is about scoring. Really, that's what is sort of entertaining. And people want to see. People want to see. You know, in the twenty twenty games, smashing sixes over the fence and yep. the crowd engagement. I think we were just right there. And and look at the numbers, like. Stadiums like I saw 17,000 at the Kings this year. I haven't seen that stadium full since I was at the 2000 Olympics, really. Um, you know, Perth just since the benchmark every year. Adelaide was getting it going, Brisbane tried to do what they could do with the new arena. New Zealand, new ownership is sort of playing more at the big arena. So I think it's you know, Melbourne's selling out a lot as well. So it's, it's really. It's a really positive thing. And I think 1.5 million basketballers now, the stats don't lie. So we've got to, Basketball Australia's got to get it together. They've got to like lead us in a way for Olympic tier one sport and take a hold of what we've got because, you know, so many sports would kill for this opportunity that we've got. And we're an Olympic tier one sport. Like yeah. half these sports aren't even played, you know? And so it's... It's time to sort of let's get cracking on it and 
these sort of conversations and things that are happening, I'm enjoying the more media, the more talking points, the water cooler talk. You know, it's sort of, it's always been so much NBA. And I think now it's NBL again, as well yeah. as obviously the NBA will always be there. But, you know, I think that's what's really pleasing. Young kids are starting to see and know NBL players because it's on multiple platforms to watch. So I think that's really encouraging for the sport. Boys and girls, the WM WNBL has been an outstanding league for so long. And, you know, we're getting WNBA girls here consistently. And that's, that's something we can really use as well. How much do you think um, the added exposure um, of the league has had to do with opening up um, the, you know, the TV rights to, um, you know, free to wear, whereas prior it used to be on paid um, television. Because um, I remember watching the game in the 90s and it used to be telecast on Channel 10. Yep. And it was the boom era um, yeah. when you were growing up and um, when you were starting off your That's professional it. career. Yep. Um, I remember it was, the, that was the high point for me in, in my memory about basketball in Australia and I similarly to you I, I I got the feeling last season that people are paying more attention to the league I mean LaMelo Ball and RJ did their yep. part being yep. headliners for the upcoming draft but as as a league and in its own right and and as a product I think it was a very good product and yeah. it just got better last year yeah, you're right. Do you swizzle? You're on the money, man. I think that, that that's what was exciting over the few years before that to lead up to that. It was sort of like, here we are. We're here now. We're relevant. Boom. We made those moves. Uh, having Bo get back. Just names, you know, like Aaron Brooks. That's some big time. This is probably the most decorated player to play. Unfortunately, sad for him to have to end his career. It looks like how it went down. You know, the Hawks yeah. just didn't quite go that way. But, you know, like it just shows the, the sort of draw card that, that we can bring people want to live here people want to live in a country like this it's summer everywhere else is winter europe is a tough gig europe is fantastic but it's nine ten months you know you're doing two a days hard you're playing a lot of games and it, it drags on this is you can make really good money in a short period and then jump into maybe play the back end of europe and things like that guys like josh children's so i'm still communicate with a lot our harrington's i'm in touch with but that, those guys tell their boys they're like our harrington's like one of the godfathers of the nba he was one of the last guys to go high school through it and like he's got a lot of weight a lot of power and so they're telling dudes like yeah go out there and look to play like my buddy w did a scrimmage the other day in orange county uh, anthony susanjara who played uh, he's a city kings boy and he he's in tyson chandler walks up to a, a workout and all of a sudden he's like that's a dude that could play in the nbl you know like that's legitimate to come and play because it's not so taxing on your body you know i think we're very we've been very smart with the sports science for a long long lot of years you know since the institute of sport was around we've really learned a lot about about how to take care of our bodies and get the most out of it and it's something that you know why the uh, coe now the institute of sport program is so we're so dominant where, where else do you get 12 to 14 of the best boys and girls that live and breathe basketball together and then go represent the country like it's just a fantastic sort of program with the nba academy as well so all these things are starting to happen i think it also is looking at well maybe we're doing things right and teaching the game the right way here and why was there you know 12 nba dudes playing from australia at one time you know i know it's reduced a little bit now but there's a reason for that you know we it's, it's almost like you need that Aussie as a glue guy. You look at guys like Della Vadova and Paddy Mills and guys like that, that, you know, just phenomenal teammates and on the bench. And, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a legitimate thing that clubs look at. What would your, if you were given the keys to the kingdom and uh, given uh, the directorship of running the league, what would be, say, two key areas you'd, you'd want to improve on? Um, to to grow the game. The tough one. I think they're doing an excellent job. It's hard to do better than what they're doing right yeah. now. I, I take a lot of my hat off to Larry uh, Kesselman and what they what they've been doing. Um, I think just the point earlier. I think it's going to be even with the, name of, the amount of games. For some reason, we've been stuck on this twenty eight games. It happened mm -hmm. different times when I was. And sometimes you played teams three or two times. It used to be then. Now it should be everyone four. So I think more games. I think more games. Like it, it's it's going to help. So if another team comes in, then all of a sudden it's the two games at home, two away. I think I think we're ready for it. I think if clubs are, you know, 
are being able to make money, we know that we're going to always have to help out particularly the smaller markets. But yep. I think that should be averaged out. I think the ones that are doing well, I think we're looking at that. So we have that inclusion and we don't have to have when I was like my second year, I think, in the league where we lost three teams in one false sweep. Yeah. They got rid of the rollers, you know, they got rid of Geelong. Uh, also got rid of, uh, who was the other team? Sorry, then it was uh, one, two, three. Yeah, all, all, all at once, you know. So I think in a way the talent went through to help the league, but you look at how many basketballs we've got in college uh, and coming out here. So I think, is there another way for your second point you asked me to maybe encourage more to come and play earlier in a way? Because it is great and you wanted to get the degree and you want to do the four years, but I just know as turning pro earlier and then still being able to go to college after playing NBL for two years back then before that really a lot of the NCAA rules changed. And yeah. I think that would be really encouraging as well. I think there's a place for it. I mean, if ever so next year, if it's going to be a, uh, restriction on imports and restriction on really how's this whole travel international going to work. Um, I think, you know, the more Aussie talent would really, really help. But saying that I did love that we were able to load up some teams with, you know, three, three or four <laughs> Americans. If you take the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the rising star and we had rising stars in the last, last year or so, I thought it was pretty, pretty damn good to see some of the talent out the floor. Cause as a collective, yeah, you, you, play better because you're learning better skills from elite athletes. Um, I, I don't think, you know, you all automatic. I've always believed you're a, you're a product of your environment um, yep. and you, you can buck the trend for sure, but um, ultimately you develop good habits from seeing good habits formed around you. And That's right. um, you know, the, the more talent that the league can bring in um, or develop, more importantly, develop homegrown talent, the better it is going to be for the league in itself. 100%. I think that you're right on point there about that. And I think we are doing a really good job developing, developing players, but then normally we lose them to the bigger contracts. Yeah. You know, I think Europe, we still got a lot of, a lot of great ballers in Europe, but we just yeah. see that, okay, now all of a sudden, you know, guys' salaries are, are up there. You know, I mean, the, unfortunately, with what's the COVID situation, they're probably going to have to be reduced, like everything. Uh, every sporting team's really struggling, I guess, just not having those TV rights and gate takings and all that. So yeah. I think, you know, that that's that's why it could even be an even better opportunity for some of these guys to write, okay, I'm right there in the middle of my second, third year in college or going into my senior year. Is it, is it now time to come out and join an NBL team? And I can, I can really you know, get my opportunity early. And I think that's the thing. You just never know when your opportunity is going to come and you're going to take, you know, you're just going to be ready for it. Yep. Holy agree. Holy agree. Hey. Great in depth. Great in depth though, um, Ben, just to, just to hear your thoughts of the game. Uh, you pretty much have your, your, your pulse on the NBL and the NBA with, with all your connections and um, connections in the game. So, I guess um, some news, I guess, we want to talk about with NBL. Um, do you know the Hawks, the Illawarra Hawks, as someone pointed to us in Instagram? Uh, they get them, the dog, they were bought out uh, this week by uh, the ex uh, 76ers uh, GM, Brian Calangelo. Uh, yeah, Calangelo, I said it probably. <laughs> yeah, and and I heard today, I guess from Lloyd, that um, they might get Brian Gorgian back. Well, what are your thoughts on uh, that? Yeah, well, I think Dory Kadahi, that's another one you've got to mention that's a Sydney boy that was a part ownership of the Sydney Kings. It's a, a majority in that piece as well. And I think he okay. has strong connections with Gorge. And I think no doubt that uh, if there's some money around or whatever, that they could maybe sway him. But from all accounts, I think he's back from China and potentially available. Now, I, I'd love him to coach, but I think he'd be amazing uh, in in. Uh, when you said the keys to the kingdom, uh, the Switzerland again, I think you put a mic and a camera in front of that guy, that's going to be entertainment all day. I think that's yeah. the thing. eventually he could turn into uh, being that sort of presenter type guy or, you know, I just think it's, it's just got that personality for it. So, but it'd be a great move for the Hawks, you know, I think if that can happen, but it's funny, they dropped the Illawarra part, right? They're just hawks at the moment. So. Yeah, they okay. So the person that the person that corrected on Instagram needs to be corrected. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's the part about that. I think that they are hawks because I think Canberra is definitely interested in playing games that they've already done. But could that also be a relocation to Western Sydney? Could the market's obviously bigger? The Kings had that. Uh, you know, um, 
I think the deal was the Kings were the only team for 10 years or something, but maybe with this situation and how, you know, it's tough in Illawarra because 41 years of doing it, but I just felt that the stadium is a little bit old, the game nights are okay, but they're getting three, three and a half thousand people. You know, it's got to be more like a Cairns environment where you're at least getting 5,000 or so and there's enough people in the community to support it, but it's just tough that every year it almost seems like, oh, they're reaching out to, to get help. And I guess that's the tough part of being a smaller market, but they've somehow, they're the ultimate survivors and uh, they've found a way to do it for 41 years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, look, uh, they're bringing in some, uh, they're big names there. When you think about yeah. how the 76ers got transformed from uh, all the years of struggle. Um, and, you know, it's 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 going to be interesting to see the the bounce back because the Hawks had a bit of a disappointing year last year, um, finishing on uh, on the bottom, five and twenty three. So uh, yeah, it was a tough year, wasn't it? After they yeah. look look at the roster, you would have you know challenged yeah. that with any you know really hundred yeah. percent stayed healthy, and that's the real trick, isn't it? The NBL trying to any league in basketball just trying to stay healthy at the right times, and um, unfortunately, they just a few injuries really hurt them. They couldn't get it going. You know, it gets a lot of pressure on Coach Flynn. To, 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 to get that done and um, it looks like potentially I guess new ownership they're probably not um, going to look to go with him again Sure Ben so, so one more story that I read up when I was doing research was um, when you were 17 and you're on the U- US uh, West Coast uh, tour you were sent home for apparently running a muck in San Francisco what does nearly, running a muck nearly in? nearly oh. sent home nearly nearly had a nearly, stir, nearly. Had a, ah, yeah. okay 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> had a very, very stern uh, warning and, and talk by, uh, uh, was it Bernie Slattery back then in the ITC program, Rex Nottage, who's still involved at Newington College. And I guess, you know, I, I had a credit card for the first time, you know, shopping, you know, <laughs> 17 looking, years know, old. <laughs> Michigan Wolverines, yeah, I'm a Michigan guy, you know, I'm like, well, the Fab Five, I just lost my mind shopping at one of those super malls and, uh, yeah, it wasn't quite right uh, where I needed to be with the team. So I guess they tried to re-align uh, me really quick on that because uh, we're in San Francisco and it was uh, Alcatraz was just right ahead. So I thought yeah. uh, they might lock me up in there. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a hell of a trip though. I tell you, that, that was something that probably changed my life just to go to America like First time I had nachos, whatever the hell are nachos. You know, um, I'm 17 years old and I see Magic Johnson play, the Lakers play the old forum against uh, the Houston Rockets, who were the back to back champs that year. Yes. And it was Olajuwon, oh. all yeah. those dudes. So it just, and we went 11 and 1 or something on that tour. We were, to be honest, a New South Wales select team. So it was country and metro combined. But, you know, to go up against guys that were all pretty, pretty, pretty stacked in some teams and to, to absolutely dominate, you suddenly thinking, and I can go to this D1 college or play at this school because mm. all these guys are signing at these schools. It just made you just open your mind up a lot more to things and realizing that, you know, there's a big world out there. And um, it was my real first taste of what American sports is like. And it's just, they do it right. They do it well. And they just put on a show. And it's been something that they, um, you know, well, the NBA is in such an unbelievable position right now, you know, and it, it just, just really eye opener. To, to the world at that age and uh, then it was hard to actually not want to go to college after I just wanted to go pro and stay pro that was always my goal I had good opportunities to go to Metro State where I would have definitely been a part of, I think of a, a NCAA Div 2 championship which ended up Mark Worthington and Luke Kendall got recruited to a little bit a little bit younger than me but Mike Dunlap was there running the show it was a very he was an Adelaide 36ers coach for a little yeah. while tight with Gorge and he said well look you can play NBL uh, or you can go to go to college you could still do that back then after earning money and um you know it was yeah it was a hell, hell of a trip that's for sure <laughs> yeah salary hell of a trip so yeah that's that's pretty much all i had for for myself uh this right. whistle did you have any uh, i just any want to thank ben thanks for coming on to the shooters role uh, this is uh, the podcast made by fans for the fans and we're certainly a big fan of you ben and uh, we do appreciate your time for sharing your insights and most importantly, you know, um, teaching um, the next generation of players how to be professional because, um, you know, you're not born with it. These are things that uh, lessons in life you learn along the way and uh, get honed in at really key moments in your life. So do thank you, Ben.
Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, guys. And uh, I've still got the shooter's role at the moment. So, you know, it's uh, <laughs> good to be on board. <laughs> great, great, great uh, segue there. So, yeah, so if you, um, you watch us, yeah, enjoy our content, please subscribe. Um, we're on YouTube, we're on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, our main, main platforms. Uh, ben, uh, so do you offer coaching? Do you offer yeah, coaching, private coaching? Yep. Okay, that's cool. It. So I'll basically link down uh, Ben's uh, Facebook site down here. So give him a shout out um, if, if you basically want um, your players to go to college. That's it. Make ben, it I've got a Facebook page on that. You know, you'll be able to find me there or Instagram. So just check it out. And um, anyone in Sydney wants to work out any time, it's, uh, it's quite good. Joe Ingalls, when he's in town, I work him out and a few guys like that, which is great. So always available. We need more courts in Sydney, by the way. So we get that out there. <laughs> Shout out to the government there. Yeah, come on. Cash, build those courts, baby. We need them. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ben. Thanks yeah. for being so candid with us and um, exchanging your, your personal experiences. Like, yeah, just I just listened to your stories. Um, yeah, it just took me back to a, a time where just watching the NBL was um, pretty much the end day to me. So, Thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.